Welcome to our online service. As I record this, it's the middle of May. Uh, the sun has started to shine uh, and things are full of promise. Also, uh, I've just uh, noticed on the news in the last couple of days that uh, they've just finished a competition for deciding who's going to make the dessert for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. And there was a lady they were interviewing on the news, um, talking to her about this trifle that, uh, that she's made. Uh, and being very pleased about it and uh, understandably so there were some very clever people on there trying to make things uh, and and hers has been chosen uh, somebody in her family would have the pleasure of saying that's my that's my mum or that's my sister um, uh, that, that's a that's a lovely thing isn't it uh, equally as I said at the beginning uh, the sun's coming out I can look around in this world uh, and see how nice everything is beginning to look uh, and I can say uh, that that my father made this, my heavenly father made all of this. Um, and he has something even more wonderful than this uh, prepared for us in eternity. And that's an amazing thing. And it, what a joy it is to know him as our father. Um, let me lead us in prayer as we start our meeting. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have made. Uh, you have made us, you've given us life, uh, and you have made this wonderful world that we live in. We thank you for it uh, and for what you have given us. We thank you even more uh, that we can say that there's a place prepared for us who love our Lord Jesus, uh, something for eternity, something even better uh, than we know here, and we thank you for that. Pray that, uh, Lord, as a, in the course of this meeting, that we come to know more about that, uh, and if we don't know you yet, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you yet, that, that again, in your grace, you would speak to them. Pray that you would bless your word to us now as we turn aside to receive it. Amen. Good morning and welcome once again to our monthly apologetic spot. 
In the last month, uh, we had Emily considering, did Jesus actually exist? And then shortly before Easter, we had a book review which discussed, did Jesus actually rise from the dead? These headings are what we might call a Christian apologetics, just to re-emphasize the point that we're not apologizing for the Christian faith, we're defending it in the hope that uh, people can see how much sense it makes and uh, their inquiries might then begin as to what they must do uh, to become a Christian. I'd like to begin uh, with a famous quote actually from probably the most well-known atheist in the world, Richard Dawkins, who in his book The God Delusion said, if God wanted to forgive our sins, why didn't he just forgive them? This actually turns out to be a fundamental misunderstanding of sin. Supposing a judge was always letting people off, a rapist and a murderer came to him and after being found guilty, he just said to them, oh, I can see you're sorry, so I'm going to let you off. Off you go. Imagine the reaction of the closest relatives and friends of the victim. They would be outraged, wouldn't they? And they would demand justice. Of course they would. And punishment too. And then as we think of Jesus and the cross, why this, why this particular death, this human sacrifice as some see it? Wasn't this a particularly gruesome way? Couldn't he have found another way to forgive sins? Or to put it in the words of a well-known YouTuber, could you please explain to me exactly why it's better that this particular blood sacrifice made anything better, like uh, some ancient primitive tribe taking up a young virgin to the edge of a volcano and casting her in, in order to appease an angry god. Now, in order to um, uh, say something about these objections, we have to introduce the word sin. Sin is the key. What is sin? Well, sin is an immoral act against a given law. Of course, if there's no God, then there's no question of an immoral law. It's just up in the air. It's one person's opinion against another. Consider what society, for example, believes now, as compared with what it believed 50 years ago in the era of sexual ethics. And we might ask, what is it going to believe in 50 years time? But if there is a God, then right and wrong exist and stand outside ourselves. Um, right becomes a reflection of God's character. If God is love, then it's right to love others as God loves them. And it's wrong to hate people. Um, without understanding this, we will not make sense of Jesus' death. Rebellion against God is called sin. Not only does sin exist in the world, but it's a major problem, because if we rebel against God, we sin. Our sin separates us from the creator and the sustainer of life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Not talking about physical death, but about spiritual death. Sin separates us from the source of truth and life. So Jesus on the cross was that solution. But before we come to that, we need to understand one other thing about God. God is just. A few moments ago, I spoke about the judge who was always letting people off for wrongdoing. But in God's courtroom, it's we ourselves who are in the dock. But what is unusual about this courtroom is that God is both the judge and the offended. This means he is in the unique position of uh, setting the penalty and forgiving humans of their guilt. God absolves us from our sin by paying the sacrifice himself, which was required for his justice. He died in our place on the cross for our sins. Some skeptics might say and have said um, that this was an example of divine son abuse. But Christians believe that God is three persons in one. And such a comment is really a misunderstanding of what the Trinity actually is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this means that God did not sacrifice some hapless human being, or angel for that matter, 
as the method of payment for our sins, because he and Jesus are one. God paid the penalty himself. Jesus was not, by the way, an unwilling victim. Jesus said, no one takes it, that's his life, from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. You see, as far as sin is concerned, we're all in the same boat. But the difference between Christians and unbelievers is that Christians acknowledge their guilty position before God and accept God's forgiveness paid for on the cross by Jesus. The Bible says that those who are reconciled to God will stand blameless before him. Without the problem of sin to solve, all you have is an ancient people believing in the need to sacrifice a human in order to appease an angry God. But Jesus' death was the ultimate solution for mankind's ultimate problem. That's how a blood sacrifice makes things better. Thank you for your time. Hello, I'm Stephen, and um, I've chosen the song Light of the World, You Step Down Into Darkness. And I chose this song because the Lord is able to open the eyes of a person spiritually as well as physically. And he demonstrated that in God's word when he opened the eyes of a man who was born blind from birth. And then... At the end of John chapter 9, the blind man who could now see said that he believed. And so the blind man's eyes were not only opened physically, but spiritually as well. And then in John chapter 8, the Lord said, I am the light of the world. And then on the first day of creation, God said, let there be light. Because over all the earth was darkness. And when God saw the light, he said, it was good. And now I'm going to read you the words of the song that I've chosen. Light of the world. You stepped down into darkness, opened my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above, humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, This morning's reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 8 to the end. So it's 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts honour Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behaviour in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome to our 116th Sunday online meeting for the 15th of May 2022. Thank you for joining us. Righteousness, contrition and redemption is the subject. Today we're dealing with Psalm 34. We have been for the last two weeks. This is the final part in that series and we're dealing with verses 9 to 22. Uh, Formally, I called the first four verses Hallelujah David was giving a very personal testimony of the Lord's goodness and deliverance and rescue of him. And the word hallelujah means you praise the Lord. He was praising the Lord for his great deliverance and he was saying, you join in. You, on the basis of my testimony, I know you can have the same. God will deal with you in the same way. And secondly, I called it, very similar really, but I called it what he's done for others, he'll do for you. A line of an old song. Um, the same, the same thing. For instance, a person who seeks God, their face lights up because I'm, I'm wanting him to help me and he doesn't, I'm not disappointed. Uh, even if we're poor in character, this poor man cried, taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, you experience it. Similar kind of thing. Now we're coming to what it's all about, what we're really being saved 
from in the deepest sense. Yes, we might get ourselves in a mess as David did. Remember, we spoke last week about the situation with the Philistines that he got himself in a mess. The Lord got him out of that. But in the deepest sense, what he and we and what he was very aware of need to be delivered, rescued, saved from is sin. Saved from that sin to righteousness because unrighteousness is sin, that which is not right, that God is right and, and his law is a righteous law, it reflects his character and that's how we should be and then if we are, we have perfect fellowship with him, there's no barrier between us anymore, sin is a barrier. So that's the first point, righteousness and the other two points are, are, are only of any, make any sense if they are viewed in, in, in the light of righteousness. Most of what he says is righteousness. Then he speaks about contrition, being sorry that I'm not righteous. And then redemption, being rescued from sin and being made righteous. So that's our subject, righteousness. Um, and how important it is, looking at Psalm 34. Remember, I've, I've called this, um, uh, series, or maybe you don't remember, maybe this is the first time you're listening, but listen to me. That comes from verse 11 here. You know, in other words, David had something he wanted to convey, and, and, and this is important. Listen to me, and, and listen to how important righteousness is. Verses 15 to 17. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry them. They're the ones he sees, concentrates on and hears and, and rescues and so on. Verse 16, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, the opposite of righteousness, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. In the end, uh, only righteous people will be remembered. It's the only thing worth doing. And everything that's wrong and awful will be ex absolutely expunged. It won't even be thought of in the final analysis. Verse 17, the righteous cry, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Their troubles. It's worth being righteous. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yeah, lots of problems. But the Lord delivers him out of them all in the final analysis. And then verse 21, evil shall slay the wicked. The very things that they're engaged in will be their own destruction. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate, empty, on their own, guilty, forlorn, lost. Dreadful situation. And it's what David had been speaking about personally. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And, well, what was true for me is the general rule for the righteous. Now, this is important in the New Testament. This is a Psalm, Psalm 34, it's part of the Old Testament. And some people think, well, the New Testament is different. No, it's not. God doesn't change in his character. Righteous, righteousness is as important now as at any, any time, and it will be through eternity. Um, the thing about it is, my own righteousness cannot save me, or rather I cannot be saved or right with God by my own efforts of righteousness because they're shot through with sin. And the danger is that I'm proud. I think I can and I can't. And that may make us underplay righteousness. Well, um, let me quote to you 1 uh, Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12 where he quotes Psalm 34, some of the very verses we've been reading. Um, actually, I, I, I realise I haven't quoted to you the, the verses from Psalm 34 that I intended to, so let me do that first. Verse 11, come ye children, hearken to me, listen to me. I, be, I began to say that. I will teach you the fear of Jehovah. Jehovah, the Old Testament name for God. Um, that, that reverence, that awe, bear him in mind, keep who he is always in your mind and live before him. That's the beginning of everything that's right and proper. That's the beginning of, of, of knowing anything that's really worth knowing. Um, 
I'll teach you that. Well, what did he teach them? He taught them righteousness. Acting rightly is to honour and fear and be in right relationship to God. So he goes on, what man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Be honest. Say the truth. Don't twist it. Depart from evil and do good. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That which makes for peace, don't argue it in an unnecessary way. Don't stir up trouble. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. I'm reading this because it's quoted in a moment in 1 Peter. And his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now notice 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, uh, and I'm beginning to read at verse 10. Uh, here we are. He that will love life. This is to the church. Let, uh, and will see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. He's quoting the psalm. Let him eschew or turn from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and rush after it, pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And so, so you see, it, it's vital. Righteousness is vital to the New Testament as well, that we are righteous. Let me read you a couple of verses from 1 John. This is chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he, God, the Lord Jesus, is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. If you're born of the Spirit, you're born supernaturally, born again, born from above into the kingdom of God, into the family of God, then you're going to be righteous. It's going to be evident. And evident is the right word. Let me read you verses 7 of eight, seven and 8 of the next chapter, 1 John chapter 3. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous. Well, how can you be deceived about that? Well, you can. <laughs> but if you do righteous... Ness, you're righteous, even as he is righteous. The righteousness of God is, be, is beginning through a work of God in the people of God. He that commits sin is of the devil. Stark, there it is. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The Lord Jesus came, he died, he's the Son of God, he rose again to destroy what the devil has done completely, but in me. And, and, and he was made manifest, it was so that you could see, made obvious that he's come for this purpose. Now, so, so why would I continue as a Christian in sin? Verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest. Same word, are made obvious, clear. And the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loves not his brother. Loving your brother, loving is the highest form of righteousness. So, so you can see clearly that there's a form of righteousness that is above what is natural. It's what God does in us. It, and it's, it's becoming like his righteousness and finally will be entirely like his righteousness. Which is why Jesus said, blessed, supremely happy are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. If, if you're hungering and thirsting after it, you must realise that you're not, you haven't got it. And, and, and Food and drink in the body of a person, that body would cry out for it. If, if you, oh, for a drink of water. I need food, I'm dying without it. And that's how it is without righteousness. And Jesus said those people who realise that are blessed, not because they are not righteous, but because they realise they're not and they want it. And Jesus said, for they shall be filled. 
It's a blessed thing to, to realise how unrighteous you are and to want to be righteous because you will be filled with righteousness, the righteousness of God himself. And indeed, the Apostle Paul said, uh, the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy because they follow righteousness in the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural righteousness. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the work and the person of Christ to make me supernaturally righteous. Listen to me. L listen to, I'll show you the fear of the Lord. I'll show you how to be righteous. Well, in the New Testament, it's even more wonderful. I'll show you how the Lord, not just what you should do, but how it's possible through his work. You want God to hear you, to rescue you, to answer your prayers? Be righteous. It does present a certain problem. Um, well, we'll come to, to what that is. And the next point I want to make from Psalm 34, and this one and the last one will be briefer, I think, it is contrition. And contrition means that, that remorse, that sorrow that I'm not righteous. I'll talk about the problem that, that brings in a moment, but let me just read to you um, part of the verse of the song that I think we've already heard in this service. Talking about a person looking at what Jesus has done on the cross. Once again, talking to the Lord Jesus. Once again, I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Broken, A, because I realise, I feel broken, because I realise my sin, how awful it is. And I am broken. I'm not what I should be. I'm not righteous. And then when I realise that, that, that the, the awfulness of my sin is such that to put me right, you had to become a man and die. When I consider that, that's how awful sin is. That's how much you want me to be righteous so that I will be like you and one with you and friends with you and with you forever. Well, that causes me to be broken, to be contrite, to be sorry that I'm like this. And the promise is that God is near and saves such a person. Let's read it again. Verse 18. Jehovah is near to them that are of a broken heart, not because their loved one has gone off or because they've had some tragedy, but we're talking about salvation. Broken because of the kind of, that I've let myself down, I've let God down, I'm not what I should be. I've let these people down. I've done what's wrong. There's something wrong with me. Broken heart. And he saves such as be of a contrite spirit. I wish I was different. Now, here's the problem. Do you have to be righteous in order to be heard, which is kind of implied by the psalm, or do you cry to be made righteous, which is implied or taught rather by the psalm? Well, both. Certainly it was true in the Old Testament, but in New Testament terms, because of my sin, I cry out to be saved, make me different. And he saves me, he not only gives me the gift of the, of the coating, like a clothing of righteousness as a gift, but he begins a work and I become one of the righteous and there's a new power to do what's right, though it's a process and I won't be perfect until I see him. And then once I'm one of the righteous, then I can call out for help and his ear is open to me. In that sense, so both are true. And so we come to the last point, redemption. It's the last verse in the psalm, Psalm 34, 34, verse 22. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate or alone or, or, or guilty or forlorn. We've come across that verse already in the, in the negative sense. I'm going to read you the way David, uh, the king, who had just been told he couldn't build the temple, um, and was sitting and reflecting and he was praying. And I'm going to read you 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 21. Note how he uses the word, this same word, redemption or redeem. He says, 
And what nation in the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem, to be his own people, to make you a name of greatness and terribleness by driving out nations from before your people, whom you have redeemed out of Egypt. The story is of the nation. They were slaves in Egypt. They were being badly treated by Pharaoh the king. They couldn't escape. But God, in his great love and mercy, came to rescue them. It's called redeeming them. And the way it happened was they, they each household, I'm cutting the story short, but these are the vital parts. Each household had to offer a lamb, a perfect lamb that was killed. And, and the blood of that lamb was put on the, do, the doorposts and the lintel of the house. And when the angel of death passed over the land, when he saw the blood, he passed over and did not kill the firstborn of that house. Whereas in every other household in Egypt, the firstborn was killed. And that was how Israel were delivered. They were, they were sent out by the Egyptians. They couldn't stand it anymore. And, and that's when they began their journey. They became a nation then. They were redeemed. That's what David is referring to here. Now, um, David now in this psalm, uses the same word to do with the personal souls, his own soul, well, the souls of others, because he's teaching about it. But elsewhere, um, the, the, the same word is used about the personal soul, his own soul. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. In other words, each individual needs a personal exodus, that is a, a coming out of the bondage of sin, so that through blood, the blood of the lamb being applied, and then they can follow the Lord where he, where he leads them, away from the, what's called the house of bondage. That was even in the Old Testament. And of course, that's a perfect picture of what the Lord Jesus did. He is our Passover lamb that is slain for us, and we are slaves to sin. And, and whereas the Bible speaks about Christ being the propitiation for our sins and also for the sins of the whole world, that's the general situation. In other words, in general terms, he's the saviour of the world. But it's only when it comes to my own soul that he's my saviour, that he comes to redeem me, so that in the New Testament the redemption is like that, that that is the thought, the slave market. And I, I'm in the slave market of sin, and I cannot escape. And I need someone to rescue me, to redeem me, to, 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 which means to set me free. And of course, the Lord Jesus is the Redeemer. And he's paid the price of my redemption, the ability to set me free. It's his own blood. Just as that lamb died to redeem Israel, so he is the lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. And in time, he's been killed um, for my sins. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he comes with, with that ransom price, that redemption price, and I am set free. Free to be righteous, free from sin. There's a basic change in my heart. And because of that, I can serve him. And he leads me in the paths of righteousness. He would never lead me anywhere else. And finally, he leads me through life. And finally, in the kingdom of his father, the righteous will shine forth. In other words, that which he's done in them will finally be finished and there'll be nothing hiding the righteousness, the purity, the wonder of who he is. Yes, it should be obvious now that there's something different and righteous about a Christian. It's manifest now, but then there will be nothing to disguise it. They will be all righteousness and it will be demonstrated. Listen to me. You must be as righteous as God. The perfect, pure one. You must. There's no hope for you or anyone otherwise. And that should lead us, leave us contrite. I'm not like that. I'm way off that. I'm, I'm a million miles from that. 
the best things I try and do when I try and do them. And I don't always try and do them. They're spoiled, they're marred by selfishness and sin. I need to be redeemed. I need to be made righteous, set free from my unrighteousness, my sin. Jesus is the Redeemer. I sought the Lord. I called upon him and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Fears of never being good enough. Well, he will make me good enough and he'll make me. Now he'll begin the work so that I can be classed. Yes, I'm, I'm failing, but there's a new life in me and I can be classed among the righteous that he hears. <laughs> and finally, I will be all righteousness, goodness, mercy, purity, satisfied with what he's done in me when I, and I will see him face to face. That's what we have to look forward to. Righteousness, contrition, are you there? Redemption, don't stop at contrition. Ask him to redeem you. Lord Jesus, save me. You've done all that's necessary to do it. You've died for me. Now you're living to save me. Please save me. And I guarantee you, in the name of God, that he will. Amen.
pray together, shall we? We thank you for the wonderful way, different ways in which you speak to us about your love and plan of salvation. Please give us the grace to apply this to ourselves. Take it very personally and find that you are the saviour of all who call on you. Lord Jesus, save me, redeem my soul, make me righteous. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Spirit, be and remain forever with everyone who has prayed that. Amen. Amen.